Welcome to the Dr. Artis Show. I'm your host, Dr. Brian Artis. Uh, what is the date today? I think it's June 29th. Anyway, that's when we're recording this show. We're very excited to have you here. Uh, as you all know worldwide, that uh, I've taken a very strong stance against hospital protocols, ill-advised protocols, and treating illness and disease. Uh, but it really got started with uh, the ill-advised hospital protocols surrounding COVID-19 and how that related the research, the information behind that hospital protocol, how it was three times as toxic and caused the exact same detrimental effects I witnessed for myself and my wife did too uh, when they uh, killed my father-in-law in a hospital in February of 2020. Ill-advised hospital protocols, drug poisoning, took his life in nine to 10 days. Uh, so I've been a very outspoken individual when it comes to uh, trusting early treatment, trusting more natural alternative therapies for the rest of your life. Uh, regardless, uh, I have very little faith actually in any hospital setting ever. Uh, and they've just continued over the last 20 years to demoralize my trust inside of the uh, medical profession. That doesn't mean the people in that profession I don't trust. Uh, and as you guys have witnessed over the last two years, uh, it has been a an honor actually to stand beside some of those individuals medical professionals, scientists, attorneys, nurses, who have actually stood against the corruptness uh, that they couldn't see, uh, were unaware of, or didn't want to look at uh, in their careers prior to COVID-19 uh, and the just horrific, tyrannical things they did. All right, so let's get through our sponsors, and I'm going to introduce you to a woman who's here whose mother was murdered, and uh, we visited before. But uh, she's going to take us through her mother's story and her tragic emotional journey since then. All right, so the first sponsor for today's show is the North Texas Healing Center. If any of you have any side of any symptoms, side effects, I don't care what it is, if you deal or struggle with any disease or symptoms that you've been diagnosed with that you know internally you don't have to live with, trust your intuition and call the North Texas Healing Center at 214-705-9369 or go to NorthTexasHealingCenter.com. They actually will help you, guide you, uh, take on your case personally uh, in multiple countries around the world. Uh, when I left that clinic and sold that clinic, I had patients from 16 different countries that we were serving and taking care of. So call them today. Uh, second sponsor for our show is Mike Lindell's MyPillow, MyPillow.com. Uh, go to MyPillow.com, buy a product for your house because you all need pillows and sheets and towels. Uh, I actually love the towels still. Uh, use the promo code DOCTOR. And that'll actually populate additional savings off on your purchases there. Whatever it is you want, whatever you need. They have great deals on slippers. Walmart just screwed them again and took them out of their stores. Uh, so they're having a $19 pillow offer right now, which is uh, like $100 less than what they've had ever. So go to MyPillow.com and, and check it out and support Mike Lindell and his group. In fact, Mike Lindell is going to be on a phone call with me for three hours. I just learned tomorrow morning. And uh, we're going to be on uh, Action Radio me, him, and Brandon House. It's going to be fun. Uh, all right, so next sponsor for our show is BrideonStore.com. BrideonStore.com. Go to uh, their store and shop for anything in the, that they have there, which is foods, uh, non-GMO, support foods, prepping foods, you name it, all kinds of stuff. There's supplements galore there. There's many storefront products from other people's products there. Use the promo code DOCTOR. It'll populate 5% off anything you buy there. And Brideon. Uh, and Mike Adams have done a great job there. He's been super supportive. He's doing some lab work right now that I'm super impressed with, and I couldn't be more honored to, to know and uh, be shoulder to shoulder with Mike Adams. Uh, next one is greatcare.com. Uh, this has actually been a great opportunity. Priscilla Romans has done a great job of uh, helping people around the world. I, I was uh, watching uh, Amazon Diamond and Silk the other night, watching them talk about Graith Care. They have a promo code there now. Artis is the promo code if you want to use that when you enroll at greatcare.com. This is not for people just in hospitals, but you should use them if you're in a hospital. If you're going to a hospital, you need an advocate. Just sign them up so they can help protect your life and guide you through that journey at the hospital so you're not uh, taken advantage of or destroyed or killed. Uh, and then also there's a AAA advocacy there if you have something you want my individual recommendations on on top of what they're coaching you through there at greatcare.com. There is a AAA op option, <laughs> stands for Artist Advocacy Advice. I actually, they will gather up all your medical records and information and get it to me. And then I get to sift through it and actually tell you where I would start my journey to healing with my personal recommendations. That's who's there. All right, so let's welcome to the show here uh, someone who's been struggling emotionally like I have been for the last two plus, two and a half years. Uh, we're, she's going to discuss her journey of how she lost her mother 
and how she believes and experienced that her mother was also murdered like my father-in-law was. Her name is Lorraine Valenti. I hope I said the last name right, but I want to welcome you to the show. If I mispronounced it, you can correct it. She's she's somewhere outside of the, in a suburb of France, she told me here, in <laughs> eastern Kentucky. <laughs> All right, Lorraine, welcome to the show. I'm sorry for your loss, but I want uh, you to give a little bit of the history of what you experienced. Provide some dates, uh, what happened to your mother, what her health was like, uh, what your relationship with her is like, and how your life has been upended since then. Thank you. Th thank you so much for uh, airing this because this is uh, this has happened to so many people I've spoken to. Um, and then when I heard what happened to your father-in-law and just now the time frame, it mirrors exactly what happened to my mom. Uh, my mom was the epitome of health, even at 83 years old. She was working full time. She worked for a law firm. Everybody in her neighborhood knew her. Um, she was the social butterfly. And um, she had a little bit of high blood pressure that she was taking the, the lowest possible dose, but she's never had any other issues. In childhood, she had developed some seizures from an abusive stepfather who would hit her in the back of her head. But then after she actually conceived me and my brother, all of those seizures stopped. That's incredible. All right, so, so um, I we have a very... picture of her. Can we show a picture of her, Rin? Show, show yeah. her mother clear. All right, so when was this taken? This was taken, believe it or not, this was um, her, her uh, I think it was her third marriage. Okay. <laughs> she was, um, yeah, she, she, was, uh, she was getting dressed uh, for, you know, for that occasion. This is in her apartment. Awesome. What year would that have been? That's a good question. I, I don't remember, but this is located in Bronxville, New York. Awesome. Okay. All right. So keep telling us a story about, about your mom, Claire. She looks like a beautiful lady. Yes. Yeah. So, um, I received a phone call early March 6th from my cousin, which was never a good sign. It was around seven o'clock in the morning. She says, your mom was taken to the hospital. Is that this year? That was in 2021. Okay. And, uh, I immediately called there. She was in the emergency room. She was with, um, uh, oh, first I wanted to uh, specify that the EMS took her, I guess her, her pulse and everything. And in reading the EMS notes, everything was normal. She had normal results. They wrote COVID suspicious. Her level of consciousness was alert, zero pain, no stroke. These are the EMS notes. She gets to the hospital. The reason for the visit is seizure and COVID-19. Uh, my mother was tested for COVID. She did not have COVID. She was tested for pneumonia. They said that she had a cough. Her lungs were clear. There was absolutely no reason for her to have any kind of COVID protocol um, she was otherwise in, in, in perfect health. Um, while she was there, a Dr. Norwood was uh, the doctor who examined her. And um, there was very bizarre notations that she lived alone, which was not true. She had a, a partner that she's lived with for 15 years. And they continued that narrative throughout that she had an altered mental status. And, um, it was like they were trying to create a narrative for her. She lived alone. She had this mental status. Well, if you had a seizure in your sleep and woke up to a bunch of EMS workers dragging you in your pajamas out of your home, I believe that anybody's mental state would be altered. But yet she was alert, no COVID symptoms, um, uh, mildly distressed. <laughs> well, this parallels <laughs> very, it parallels very right. closely what my experience was with my father-in-law. So he was diagnosed, supposedly they called us and told us 
that on day one, he was complaining of fever and a headache. He walked himself into a hospital, and they said that he had the flu. Uh, that's what they diagnosed him with. And then day two said he had pneumonia. And by day five, when I went up to the hospital, I demanded them show me the day one records. I wanted to know what did she, what did he test for positive. I want to see the notes. So he took me through the pathology test results, and it was negative for influenza A, influenza B, viral pneumonia, and bacterial pneumonia. Yet I had heard for five days now that he had the flu, now complicated by viral pneumonia, which he never tested positive for. And But they were treating him for the flu, supposedly, with a hospital protocol. Very sickening, ill-advised protocol that caused acute kidney failure within 24 hours to start. And it just compounded every day and got worse for five days. And it's similar with your mom's case here. EMS Very is making similar. notes. EMS is making notes as they're taking him to the hospital. And they're saying there's... No COVID, COVID suspicious, uh, no stroke, and then they get to the hospital, and now she's admitted with COVID or for COVID. Uh, at least that's what they've designated on the record. So pretty disgusting. All right, Tinny. It, it, it definitely mirrors what happened to your father-in-law, um, and and the time frame and all of it. It's like a systematic takedown of our parents, our grandparents, the elderly. I'm an mean, all for profit. Um, so the next day I actually spoke with my mother and the, now mind you, this was over a weekend. This was on, um, a Saturday morning. So you know how it goes as a doctor that you're not going to see a regular doctor until Monday, sometime Monday. And that's pretty much what happened with my mom. So she had the EMS, um, take her to the emergency room. She had an emergency room doctor, and then they were waiting for a room for her. When I spoke with her the next day, she was fine. She just wanted out. After that phone call, it was early in the morning again. I never heard from her again. I called there multiple times a day. And each time they said that she was asleep. Uh, my mother does not sleep in the middle of the day. She wanted out of there. So they were medicating her to fall asleep. They were giving her anti-seizure medicine, which I told them to not give. Um, I don't know what else they were giving her, possibly tranquilizers. They had COVID tested her that one time, which you're aware of how they do that up the nasal cavity, uh, you know, sometimes breaching the blood brain barrier. And um, she was not the same since. My brother who was estranged, I hadn't spoken to in years, uh, kept going to the hospital, wanting to see how she was. And my mother was begging him to get her out of there. Uh, she had not seen a doctor um, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. By that time, my brother grabbed my mother and took her out of the hospital. I, I think he signed her out, got her belongings, brought her home. Of course, this was very impulsive. My brother's very impulsive, but under the circumstances, I guess, you know, she was going downhill. We didn't know what to do. Um, I was the health proxy. So I was a little disturbed that my brother, uh, she was in the hands of my brother. He took her home, dropped her off, and she deteriorated. I had one phone conversation with her. She was very tired. She wanted to go to sleep and she says, well, maybe I should have taken the jab, you know, the shot. And I said, mom, this is, has nothing to do with that. Um, within 24 hours, she had a massive heart attack, went back to the hospital, was COVID tested again. She's unconscious. They COVID test her again. She's negative. But the nurse calls and says, you know, I think your mom qualifies for the COVID protocol. I said, well, what is that? She says, well, we can start her on remdesivir. And of course, at that time, I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know that it was some horrific kill protocol. I wasn't aware. I said, well, why would you be medicating her for COVID now when she's tested negative for a second time? This makes no sense. She had a heart attack. So none of this made sense. And then unbeknownst to me, I'm not speaking to my mother. They pl have to place her on a respirator. I said, well, why are you placing her on a respirator? And then a feeding tube. 
and it was one nightmare after the next. I'm here in Kentucky. They're not allowing people to visit her. And then when they finally did, it would be for one person for one hour. So at this point, like a couple of days go by and she is on a feeding tube, non-responsive. I speak to the doctor finally. I said, I need to know what's going on with my mother. They said, well, she's, she's on a feeding tube. She's on a respirator. I said, well, what does that mean? She can't breathe on her own. She can't eat on her own. So they were giving me like a song and a dance, like a, it didn't make sense to me. And then a whole another day went by. And um, I said, I, I need to know, will my mother ever be able to walk again on her own? And the doctor finally said, no. I said, will she be able to eat on her own? He said, no. I said, will she be able to speak? And he said, no. I said, are you saying that my mother's brain dead? And he wouldn't, he didn't answer me. So I set up a phone call with me and my daughter who's in Missouri. Um, my friend who lives in New York drove down there and he placed my mother on speakerphone. And I spoke with her. And, you know, I told her how much I loved her. She could not speak, but my friend Rob told me what her responses were. As soon as she heard my voice, her body started to move. Her feet moved, twitched. Her, her, her eyelids moved. And then when my daughter got on the phone, which is the light of her life, her first granddaughter, and my, when my daughter started to speak to her, Rob said her response was even uh, more frantic. And when I mentioned this to the doctor, he says, that, well, those, that, those are natural responses that normally happens. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. And um, I spoke to the doctor again and I said, will my mother ever recover to her normal, healthy life again? And he said, no. So I read my mother's wishes of the health proxy, which they had, by the way. They had it in their hands before my mother's second visit to the ER. They knew that my brother had no say in any of this. And my brother, actually told the doctors to keep her on the anti-seizure medicine, which I didn't know until I read the medical reports a couple of months later. So I told the doctor that it is my mother's wishes that if she can't resume to her normal life, walking, breathing, eating, that we need to remove everything. And I gave those orders, I think it was two o'clock in the morning. I said, I want everything removed as soon as possible. I went to bed, slept a couple of hours, called in the morning, like eight, nine o'clock in the morning. My mother was still on all of those machines. I went ballistic. How many days at this point do you think she was on all of this? Uh protocol for the second time being administered in the hospital? Probably three days. So and three days to be on a ventilator feeding tube. They already knew that she was gone. So it's They told me also, yes, I, I'm sorry. I, they, they told me also that she had liver failure, kidney failure, blood clots in her legs. This is the second time she's admitted to the hospital after this massive heart attack. So my healthy mother, vibrant, healthy, working woman who had a slight cough and had a seizure in her sleep, who was fine the next day, just wanted to leave. 
went from being perfectly healthy to being dead. I mean, I pulled the plug on the, the 17th. He was declared dead within, I think it was within 40 minutes. All right, so what date did she pass? The 17th. 17th. Uh, how have you felt since uh, getting the reports and the medical records? That's like 500 pages worth. Right. Um, I'm incredibly angry. I mean, in, and I had spoken to so many people. I called multiple times a day. I even spoke with somebody about informed consent. I said... If my mother was not able to provide that, how come I wasn't contacted? Well, the uh, nurse practitioner said, well, uh, we haven't updated our protocol, but during COVID, none of that applies. I said, well, I'm reading it on your website. Oh, well, we didn't have time to change the website. Angry is an understatement. If, if you now- I feel, yeah. Having- I feel so bad for my mom. Well, I feel bad for your mother and I feel bad for the week that all of you are having to deal with. If you now, a lot of us experience things like this and I had the same experience uh, two and a half years ago uh, and we all handle them different, see them differently. Even members of my own family see it differently. <laughs> Some of them are still convinced. Like when the medical doctor said, this is his only chance. We have to put him on morphine and overdose him for the next two and a half hours. They call that palliative care. And when they said it was going to take less than two hours for him to peacefully pass, when we just remove his pain with morphine, I told him all, I said, uh, that, that's not what they're doing with that drug. That drug paralyzes the diaphragm and stops the heart from beating. They're about to euthanize him in front of you. At the end of two and a half hours, when the medical doctors came in and said, his heart beat and heart rate's exactly the same after two and a half hours of morphine drug dosed into his veins, uh, they asked the family to sign off on doing it again. And I was like, uh, this is disgusting. Uh, so they did. They finally overdosed him with enough morphine to stop his heart in front of me and watch him take his last breath. That was horrific. If you, if you now, with hindsight being 2020 now, uh, and what you've learned and experienced in and out of a hospital with your mother's care, uh, how they viewed you as the uh, medical power of attorney or the um, proxy, as you called it, for her, and how they disregarded you, disregarded her wishes. Uh, I want you to tell my audience with hindsight being 2020 20 now, what would you have done differently? What I would have done differently, knowing everything I know now is I would have been on a plane. I would have been one of those women they would have had to have dragged out of that hospital because I would not have left. I would have been following everything that they did. And I would have gotten my mother out of there as soon as possible. In hindsight, this hospital should be sued. Everybody that experienced this, whether it's a class action suit, no one should get off uh, administering a protocol that's likely to murder someone, all under the guise of COVID. And then on my mother's death certificate, they wrote that she had heart disease for four years. They completely lied on her death certificate. In fact, the first death certificate I had changed. I said, this is not true. This is all false. It took me about four days to get it changed. And then um, they still kept COVID on it. COVID was on her death certificate. Hypertension, a heart disease. They claimed that she had heart disease. My mother had no heart disease. So her death certificate is falsified. Yeah, I'm actually. You know when when I'm yeah, actually when looking online. Up in, hold on, I just, I just want to make something very clear because some people might listen to this and go, "Well, isn't high blood pressure a heart disease?" No, it is not. High blood pressure is not defined as heart disease. Just so you all know, you can look it up online. So they lied about her having a heart disease, and this would be why she had a heart attack and why she died. This is what they're going to claim that she had been struggling with this for four years on my father-in-law's death certificate. I'd already made them aware for three days that they had lied about his pneumonia diagnosis. It was actually pulmonary edema. You could actually see the water in his lungs rising each day as they shut down his kidneys. 
and I went through those x-rays. The moment I exposed that's what it was and demanded them change the drug protocols to get the excess water out of him, within five hours, all the water came out of his lungs. On the sixth hour when I got home, they actually called my wife to tell her that uh, they were no longer following the changes we made that day that I was forcing on them to do that made the improvements to his health and cleared his lungs of all water that they said and called pneumonia for five days at that point. All the water came out. He was breathing on his own, maintained all his own normal oxygen levels. Before that, he was on forced air because he couldn't breathe through all the water. Uh, we got all that changed, but within an hour of us getting home, the hospital administrators and the doctors met together, told the nurse's station to call my wife and said, we are, we are permanently banning all the changes we made today. In relationship to his health care, we are going back to the original hospital protocol. And when I went up there the next morning to challenge them on this, because I knew they were, I knew they felt threatened that I had exposed the liability this hospital now had with the protocol they did use from the beginning that caused such horrible side effects in his health to make him unconscious, cause pulmonary edema, flooding his lungs with water, shutting down his kidneys, causing acute kidney failure. They lied about everything in relationship to his diagnosis and prognosis, which is the outcome. They lied the whole time. All I did was expose that, change it, challenge it. They got We got them to change it. The very next morning when I went up there after they decided to go back and revert back to their hospital protocol and not support the changes we made that made improvements to his health for the first time in seven days uh, is when they actually escorted me out of the hospital with security and refused wow. to talk to me because I wasn't a blood relative. They would only talk to his wife, who was in a rehab center with a broken neck, uh, and then uh, would only talk to my wife's older siblings. She's the youngest of three. So they turned it over to them and said, we will only talk to you guys. We will not talk to him, me. <laughs> so that's uh, that was how horrific that was. So it's very similar to what your experience is. Uh, and as a result of my wife witnessing all of this and experiencing all of this, it has been outright hindsight kicked in really quick. And uh, she went to her mother and said, y'all didn't trust Dr. Artis to oversee his care. Um, y'all trusted the medical profession and it ended his life in the next 72 hours. Uh, if you ever mom, my, my wife talking to her mother, if you were ever in a similar situation where you're in a hospital, uh, my husband will be the one overseeing your care and he will have medical power of attorney. No one else will because they do not want to see that experience ever again. And it's the same for her. Uh, anyway, for my wife too. So this is how uh, that's going to go for in the future. But uh, it was a pretty horrific thing that uh, they would have total disrespect and disregard for human life and follow a protocol knowing and watching one day after another that the individual's health was failing as a result. Uh, and this is when uh, it was very obvious to a few medical doctors around the world that uh, there was no longer the allowance to practice medicine. Everyone knows that not every human being is the same. So you treat with a drug, see how they react, then you change it if there's a negative outcome. There's a cause and effect. We give this drug and they get worse, we switch to another drug, and then another drug, and another drug. And experiment, that's what you do. You want to practice medicine. And uh, they have totally destroyed that over this period called COVID-19 and robbed that from every medical professional who's actually in a hospital trying to treat patients and uh, they're holding them hostage, threatening them with their licenses and with their jobs and with their livelihoods, the doctors, the nurse practitioners, and we, the families of the loved ones in the hospital continue to, to be overwhelmed emotionally, scarred emotionally, physically, and uh, are left to try to pick up the pieces. So what kind of message would you like to convey to our audiences worldwide for the future? For the future, um, I think everybody needs to pay very close attention to every protocol and be there. Uh, do your research. Don't trust these doctors. They're getting paid to write certain diagnoses. And um, when I contacted the, the health insurance company, they said, oh, well, don't worry about it. It's all covered. I said, well, I would like a detailed invoice. I, I, I want to know what everything cost because they kept my mother on respirator for nine hours longer than she needed to be. Oh, well, and I never received it. 
So the message is a uh, follow up. It's very stressful. And uh, you, you just don't know what to do. But just don't trust somebody because they're wearing a, a medical badge or wearing a stethoscope in the hospital. Uh, they're, they're being paid by the pharmaceutical companies to write certain protocols. Um, and just, you know, I, the only other thing I could say is to just stay in contact with your loved ones once they go into a, a medical facility. If you can be there with them, do it. Um, that's the one, re one of the regrets that I have. And also in that my mother, who is a very intuitive and sensitive, intelligent woman, was bound, literally bound and gagged to not be able to speak in her last moments of life to tell anybody what was happening with her and whatever her level of awareness was that she was being tortured for those days. Well, I want you to, uh, to know that I appreciate you wanting to share your story. Uh, I'm really sorry that uh, the story is one of loss and uh, abuse of power, which is what the hospitals uh, actually did. Uh, Ren, our producer, I would like him to throw up a few more of the pictures that we have of your mom. And, um, and then I'm going to say a few words to the audience about uh, the future. So here's Claire. What's what's Claire's last name again? Uh, it's Cerigliano. That sounds very Italian. <laughs> and here, this is what she was sitting at the front desk of the law firm of, I, I don't know if I should mention the name, in Bronxville. She worked there for 33 years. All right. So give uh, the audience, I want you to talk to my audience, but you're talking to your mom. Tell her, tell her your thoughts and your feelings. Give her your love. Oh. Oh goodness. Mom, I'm so thankful to Dr. Ornis for allowing me to present your story and be your voice up there in heaven. That what happened to you will be known by the world. And what you were not able to speak about, we're speaking about now. And um, obviously, I, I love you very much and miss you so much. And the last thing is, um, my daughter does not believe that she was killed. And then after my mother died, my daughter went out and got the jab, thinking that it was going to protect her. And hopefully, she'll be fine. But she still doesn't believe it. And I'm looking so forward to sharing this. And Dr. Artis, thank you so much. I was not completely aware of your story with your, your father-in-law. It parallels and mirrors mine. And the fact that you're a doctor and offered a healing protocol that was working. And they denied that and then ultimately murdered him. Uh, Mom, you're not alone. This happened to probably thousands of people. But you will be remembered. And I'm so grateful to Dr. Artis for airing this. Thank, thank you so much, doctor. You're very welcome. And thank you for your words. Uh, I, I just want to, uh, I might as well say it. Claire, go find Weldon. Y'all are both up there in heaven and uh, y'all can champion together. <laughs> and just so you know, there's uh, millions of you actually around the world who have actually been, uh, who've had your lives ended early and terminated early. And uh, we, me and a team of attorneys all over this country and around the world internationally, are actually behind the scenes building class action lawsuits right now, every week, having meetings, because we are not going to allow these people to get away with this. Uh, and there will be justice. And that is what we are determined to do on your behalf. Uh, thank you for coming, Lorraine. And thank you for sharing Claire's story. Uh, we love you. And, uh, and we obviously support you. And uh, anyway, this is my message for everyone across the world who's actually heard this testimony and this story. Do not blindly trust anyone. Now, we're talking about health and hospitals and medical doctors. I promise you, as angry as I've been for the last two and a half years, as hurt as Lorraine feels, 
there are lots of us out there that are like, I'm not trusting a medical doctor ever again. There are moments where I've felt that way many times in my life. There are individuals in that profession you can trust. You cannot trust their institutions. You cannot trust the American Medical Association. You cannot trust the FDA. You cannot trust the CDC. You definitely cannot trust the NIH at all. So these institutions are actually overseeing what the medical profession is allowed to do through their boards and through their associations. They are dictating their license, their livelihood, and telling them what they can and cannot do. There are individuals who are trying to do good by people, uh, but there's not very many of them who are bold enough, brave enough to stand up against those institutions and in defense of you or your loved ones in the future. So when I say do not blindly trust them, do not blindly trust anybody in relationship to health. And if it involves a hospital, involves the medical profession, please consider if you have an intuitive feeling that something could bad go wrong or something's going to happen that you don't trust or you just don't feel like you can trust what's about to happen, you need to get an advocate with you uh, and just do it. Go to greatcare.com, have an advocate there assigned to be there with you. They will be with you the whole time. And anything that comes up, it gets related back to the advocate. The advocate will help hold ethics committee meetings in the hospital with the doctors. They even have doctors to help there. They represent people in all 50 states and in Canada. So go to greatcare.com and get one. Uh, also, you need to have, as you are aware, if or if you're new to the audiences here or to the show, at the doctorartistshow.com, there's actually underneath forms and documents, the first two documents. If you'll just download those, print them, I cannot overstate this. There is a medical advanced directive is the first form. So this is what you designate you will and will not allow to a hospital to do to you if you ever go into a hospital. You sign it, you get it notarized at your bank or go to someone who's a notary, have them stamp it. That makes it a legal document. And then also print out a medical power of attorney form and designate someone that you love and care for to be your your mouthpiece for you in case you go unconscious in a hospital setting. Uh, you need someone there who can actually stand for you, demand for you uh, what it is that's going to be best in your care. So that's what I would recommend the most. And let me uh, let me just give you the opportunity, Lorraine, to say goodbye to the audiences. I've got a few sponsors I'm going to wrap up the show with, but uh, final words. Final words. Thank you so much for uh, discussing this really important topic. And for everybody out there, just be alert. Dr. Artis, uh, go to his website and print out these forms. This is really important. My mother did have a medical directive, but the hospital ignored it. Yep. So this is uh, this is how we can hold people accountable because uh, that's totally illegal. All right. So thank you again, Lorraine. And uh, God bless you and your family and your daughter. May she be safe and protected. Thank and, you. And I will say it is an agenda. Uh, <laughs> so uh, anyway, those are our sponsors. I'm very proud of those sponsors. Lorraine, thanks for coming again. Uh, and we are going to send you our prayers and our thoughts. And for all of those in the artist universe, hey, that's actually a good name. I should make that up. Okay. For all those in the artist universe, I just want you to know I'm standing for you, praying for you and be bold and be brave. And remember, it's your life you're living. Do not let someone else tell you what you have to allow them to inject inside of you, what you have to put inside your body, do your own research and by all means, trust your intuition, your gut, more than anything else on the planet. It will always guide you in the right direction. All right, I'm Dr. Artis. God bless you all. We're out. We're saying goodbye.